for many of us today, we're meeting our guest speaker for the first time. Uh, Karina, I have heard about you, but uh, ha have met you for the first time today. K Karina Kraminski comes from uh, Sydney. Uh, you read her CV and uh, I, I get tired reading it. Um, Karina's been a uh, senior minister of a church for 13 years. She's currently a lecturer at Morling uh, Theological College in Sydney. She's uh, a, a missionary in the inner suburb of Surrey Hills uh, in Sydney. She's an author. Uh, her latest book is uh, just about to be released or has been released. Uh, she's a blogger. Um, she's a person who's speaking widely uh, and is incredibly busy. And, and therefore, it's such a privilege for us to have her sharing with us, not only in this service, but later uh, for the Warmbrun Address. Would you put your hands together and warmly welcome Karina Kraminski. Hello. How are you all? Good. You've had a good couple of days here. It feels really good here. It does feel very warm and very welcoming. It's a privilege uh, to be here and to be able to speak today, particularly when people are getting ordained and you're gathering together as the Churches of Christ. We had our uh, Baptist Assembly in uh, New South Wales yesterday, so it must be the season for assemblies, right? Um, <laughs> And I've never been to uh, Geelong before. Is it Geelong or Geelong? <laughs> Is it Geelong or Geelong? Geelong. Because I kind of like Geelong. But if you've all decided on Geelong, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> It is really nice um, to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I had to think about uh, today and I thought, what will I speak into this context, particularly with people who are just ordained, people who are just kind of starting out in ministry, although I'm sure that you've been ministering for a while, people perhaps who are remembering their ordination long ago. Um, I was ordained in 2002, so I was thinking about when I was on a platform and getting commissioned and prayed for. It's a very special time. And others who are ordained to be in at ministry in their neighbourhoods and in your workspaces. What do I speak into that? And simply what I wanted to focus on today for this talk is thinking about how do we keep the main thing the main thing? How do we keep our attention on Jesus? How do we keep our focus on what we're supposed to be doing in the midst of all the busyness of ministry, the distraction of ministry and um, the craziness of life? And so um, I wanted to share with you uh, a story about my, my seven-year-old niece uh, my seven-year-old niece, Eva, is the love of my life. She is an explorer, she's a pioneer, uh, she's adventurous, and she's also very distracted uh, most of the times. And so when I take my niece out, and I have been doing that recently, particularly on school holidays, um, I have to really kind of make a very tight schedule and make sure, you know, we're always on track. We're always kind of going because my, my thing is, you know, we're going to get from A to B because once we get to B, we're going to have a lot of fun. So we're going to get to B as quickly as possible. And so this is my thing with Eva, just got to keep her on track. And recently we went to the beach together and uh, I thought, okay, got to keep, keep us on track, get to the beach, have lots of fun. And um, we got out of the car and we started walking towards the beach and um, I'm, you know, walking away in front of her, you know, on task, trying to get to where I'm going, uh, making sure we're going to have a good time. And I'm walking and I turn behind me and she's far away and she's dawdling along the path and she's picking up a flower and she's smelling it and she's picking up a, a shell or some kind of insect and dissecting it or yelling out, Auntie Karina, let's go this way or why don't we go that way or I'm tired and um, it, on and on it went. Finally, we did get to the beach and we had a really good time. Uh, but, but I, and you know, I love the fact that my niece loves to stop and smell the flowers and, you know, play with insects and shells and all that kind of thing. And I love the fact that she's an explorer. I love the fact that she dawdles. I love the fact that she gets distracted. I, I love that about her. But when I, I experienced that moment with her, I had this thought about our ministry and also our relationship uh, with God. 
Uh, and it reminded me of how often in my relationship and in the ministry that I do for God, uh, I can so often go off the path that I'm supposed to be on. And I'm constantly trying to align myself again to where I'm supposed to be going. I get caught up in the busyness of ministry, the distractions of life. And often I have to kind of stop and kind of realign myself and think, why am I actually here? Why am I doing what I'm actually doing? And sometimes I look behind me and I just think, where, where, where's Jesus even? He's out there somewhere and I've gone either too far ahead of him or too far behind or something's going on. I'm just not connected in my, in my walk with Jesus and in my ministry that I'm doing with Jesus. And sometimes I feel like I'm doing ministry for Jesus rather than with Jesus, right? Which is an important distinction. And so how do we actually keep aligned and keep our focus on Jesus and our walk with him and our ministry with him in the midst of all of the distractions of ministry and the distractions of life. I wanted to read for us um, this passage that uh, has stood out to me for quite some time. It's Mark chapter 1 and it's verses 32 to 39. And it says this, That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled through Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Let me give you some context to that passage, which we'll get to in a minute. Mark's gospel, as you know, uh, starts out really boldly. At the beginning of Mark's gospel, we get this passage about John the Baptist entering in onto the scene and clearing the way for the Messiah who was to come. If you have a look at chapter 1 in verse 2, Mark takes snippets from uh, the Old Testament, the Scriptures, and he says in verse 2, takes from Exodus 23, 20. He says that an angel leads Israel through the wilderness. Then he takes from Malachi 3, 1, I'm sending a messenger in front of you who will prepare a way for you. Then he quotes Isaiah. There's a voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So he's preparing for the coming of the Messiah. And he's setting up John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is drawing people to himself to prepare for the coming of the Messiah. So you kind of get this picture straight up in the Gospel of Mark of all of these people, these Israelites, right, coming to the desert where John the Baptist is preaching. And they're coming because they're hungry, right? They're expectant that something's going on. So it's kind of quite a humble picture of all of these people coming and just listening to this crazy guy who's preaching in the desert. And they're going, something's going on. We're all expecting that God's going to do something. Is this guy the Messiah? Is he preparing for the Messiah? He's quoting from the old scriptures. We're not quite sure, but we're going to go out in the wilderness and we're going to check him out. So they're hungry. They're expectant that God is going to do something. And then we see in verse 9 that Jesus arrives on the scene and he's the one that everybody has been waiting for. He's gets baptised by John, not because he needs his sins forgiven, but because he wants to identify with his people, uh, Israel. And then he comes up out of the water and this voice says, you are my son, uh, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Straight after that, right, Jesus is sent out into the wilderness, not by the enemy, but by the Holy Spirit. Sent out into the wilderness and he's tested 
in, in that time. He comes out of that time. We see in verse 14 saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. And so Jesus starts preaching out of that time of testing. And he starts saying, the time is now. Repent. This is good news, right? It's not a time of judgment. It's a time of good news. So repent and come. The time is now. Don't delay. Seek God while he's moving. And then Jesus starts calling disciples to him, right? If you have a look in verse 17, Jesus knows exactly what to say to them. They are fishermen. So what does he say? Follow me and I'll make you fish for people, right? Higher call, even though fishing for fish is good. Uh, he's saying, come to me and I'll, I'll make you fish for people. So he knows what to say to these, these people, these fishermen, to, to draw them in. And they follow him. They follow him straight away. They drop everything and they follow him. Now, we know, of course, from the other Gospels that the disciples have known Jesus. These fishermen have known Jesus for a while. And so they follow him. But here, what Mark is doing is he's emphasizing the time, right? Now's the time. Drop everything. Drop your nets. Stop fishing. Just go. Follow Jesus. The time is now. The kingdom of God is here. Seek God while he's here. So he, Mark is emphasizing this sort of, uh, the time is now, this, this is this fast-paced sort of um, action. And then what happens after this, we see that Jesus starts healing and he starts preaching. And the first pe thing that people notice about Jesus is his authority, right? In verse 27, uh, it says that people were amazed at Jesus and they said, this is a new teaching with authority. Now, what does that mean? I think people are, th are realizing that the teachers around at that time are just kind of rehearsing tradition. They're just passing stuff on. But Jesus is kind of speaking a new message. There's a, there's a different sense with some of the things that Jesus is saying. So they're all scratching their heads and wondering and amazed. Who is this person? There's something new happening here. So already we're getting the sense that this kingdom of God that is being ushered in is different. Right? It's this guy speaking out in the desert. Another guy who comes in on the scene and he calls humble fishermen to his service. There's something different about what's God doing at this time. There's something different, particularly about this, this Jesus. And so masses of people start gathering towards Jesus. And you see in verse 32, he's doing so many healings. He's exercising demons. He's speaking the good news. And it is good news it says, that evening at sundown, people brought to him all who were sick, possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. He cured many who were sick with various diseases. He cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. People are flocking to Jesus. There's something going on. God is doing a new thing and they're discerning it. They're not quite sure still what's going on, but something is happening. So let's pause here for a bit. You can get this sense, can't you, coming from the Gospel of Mark, that Jesus is being presented as this man on a mission. He's healing. He's preaching. He's delivering people. He's telling people the time is now. Come to God now. It's good news. God is doing a new thing. It's really fast paced. Man on a mission. That is how Mark is presenting Jesus. There are a lot of things that fascinate me about Jesus. He is my Lord. He is my Saviour. But one thing that I'm constantly in awe of is I wonder how it is that Jesus was able to be this man on a mission, so busy, preaching, healing, teaching, and yet still remain compassionate, focused, speaking with authority and aligned with the mission of God. How did he do that? How did he be this person who was on a mission doing the Father's work, but at the same time, 
humble, compassionate, aligned with the purposes of God, not distracted. And I ask that question because I'm a busy person and I'm sure you are busy people as well. I have a ministry at Morling where I teach and I'm also a missionary in Surrey Hills in the inner city of Sydney. I'm doing a lot of community work there. I'm connecting with people. I've got a lot of projects that are going on. It's really easy for me to get distracted and get off course and not aligned with what I'm doing and participating with God. Maybe you feel like that as well. As you engage in your ministry in your church, your ministry in your neighbourhood, or your ministry in your workplace. How do we keep aligned to the mission that God has called us to be on? How do I embody the beauty of Jesus Christ in my neighbourhood, in my workplace, in my church? So I think the passage that I read out before helps us with this. Uh, As I read out before, it says in verse 35, in the morning when it was still very dark, Jesus got up, went to a deserted place and there he prayed. Mark has presented Jesus as this man on a mission, busy, focused, healing, preaching, teaching, not distracted. And yet now what he says is that Jesus turned from all of that and spent some time with the Father to pray. Mark is telling us here that Jesus was different from the usual Messiah that everybody was, the Messiah that everybody was expecting. Yes, he was a man on a mission, but he was also a man who was able to be with the Father move away from all the stuff that he had to do in his work for God and know the Father's heart and be still with the Father. We see that Jesus uh, comes up out of this time of prayer and he says in verse 38, let us go on to the neighbouring town so that I might proclaim the message there also for that is what I came to do. So it seems like when Jesus came out of this prayer time, he was renewed, realigned on on the mission that uh, he was participating in with God. It says in verses 36 and 37 that Simon and his companions hunted for Jesus. So they're kind of in shock as well. This Jesus has been on a mission preaching, teaching, healing, all of that. And now, where is he? He's alone, in the quiet, praying to Father God. This is not what we expected from this person that could be the Messiah. Already Jesus is breaking down some of those concepts. Not your usual superhero, I guess. So I wanted to draw out some things from this passage as I finish up that I think help us to think about being aligned with the mission uh, of God, um, being aligned with God's purposes rather than getting distracted by all the stuff of life and particularly um, ministry. So I think we see in this passage that firstly, Jesus' call was to the broader mission of God, not primarily to meet the needs of the people, right? Jesus' call was to the broader mission of God, not primarily to meet the uh, needs of the people. Because what you see is all of these people gathering around Jesus, looking for a miracle, looking for a healing, looking for a word from God perhaps. As we see, the whole city has come to Jesus' door. They're right there expectant of Him and He's healing and He's working. But then He goes out, prays to His Father God and He comes out and what does He say? Let's leave this place. Let's leave this place. Jesus knows that his primary call is to the broad mission of God, not primarily to meet the needs of people. Right Now, I know those two things are related. But what I'm saying here is that sometimes in ministry, and this has happened to me, is that what happens is we can get so caught up in a particular season or in a particular place and we're stuck meeting the needs of the people or our needs in that particular place and we forget that our call, we have been ordained to the broad mission of God and we need to hear His voice because He might be calling us to leave. He might be calling us to stay but our primary call is the mission of God. 
We are in a particular context for a particular time and then we might be called to move. Our mission is God's mission, not the mission of the church. It is God's mission that we are called to and we listen to him. And I think this is what Jesus was doing here, right? He comes out out of this prayer time and instead of saying, right, I've got to go back and heal all these people and keep doing my work, he says, let's leave this place. How odd, right? His call is to the mission of God. Our call, we are ordained, all of us are ordained to the mission of God. We move as the Spirit guides us to stay or or go. And secondly, I think what comes through in this passage is that Jesus knew who he was and that gave him confidence in his ministry because we see in verse 11 that at the baptism of Jesus, and I love this, the voice of God says, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. That, that voice wasn't for the people around Jesus. It was for Jesus to hear. It was an affirmation from his father. You are my beloved. I love you. With you, I am well pleased. And I think this gave Jesus all the confidence to be able to do the work of God that he needed to do, to do the work of his father that he needed to do. He was loved by his father. And from that love, he was able to love and serve others. That gave him a confidence in his ministry. I think that's what grounded Jesus in his ministry. I think that's what helped him to be aligned in the ministry that he was doing in the name of the Father. And I think lastly, what comes through in this passage is just the deep affection that Jesus had with his Father. Like I often wonder, what was Jesus praying about when he was praying to the Father? What was going on there? You know, such deep intimacy. Uh, When I was reading a devotional on this passage, it said for Jesus to be publicly engaged with people meant being privately resourced with his father. To be publicly engaged with people meant to be privately resourced with his father. For Jesus to have such a public ministry, he needed to nurture that deep relationship with the father. So prayer was like a fuel for the mission of Jesus. That's a challenge for me because more and more I can get so distracted in my ministry that I forget to take those times out and just receive the love of God, know who I am in Christ and then from that go out um, in ministry, go out into the world, go out into my neighbourhood, go out into my workspace and embody the beauty of Jesus in, in that context. So as I think through this, uh, again, I am in awe of my Saviour and my Lord. He is my Lord. He is my Saviour. I want to be like Him. I want to follow in His footsteps. I want to be somebody who keeps aligned to the mission of God. I want to be somebody who knows who I am in Christ. And out of that love, I minister for others. I want to make sure that my prayer life fuels my mission I want to make sure that I am serving the mission of God, being the fragrance of Jesus Christ in my neighbourhood, in my workplace and wherever I go. Is that the same for you? Amen. Lord, I just thank You so much that You have empowered us by Your Spirit. I thank You, Jesus, that we are not alone. The Holy Spirit, You have anointed us. You have filled us to be on Your mission. Lord, as all of us um, minister in our churches, in our neighbourhoods, in our workspaces, wherever it might be, we know we are called by You to embody the values of the Kingdom in our context, to be the fragrance of Jesus Christ. Will You help us, Lord, to stay aligned with Your purposes, not being distracted constantly and going from the left to the right, but instead keeping to Your purposes, Your mission, God. Forgive us if we have developed saviour complexes. And Lord, uh, instead help us to focus on what You have called us to do. Lord, help us to be filled with Your love right now, empowered with Your love, that we might be able to love others from that love to know that we are your beloved and to receive that love afresh today. We pray that in Jesus' name.
Amen.